All right. How's everybody doing today? <clears throat> I hope everybody's doing good. We're just going to wait for everybody to kind of stream on in here. Um, we got quite a bit to talk about today. Uh, we have the Chernigov strike. We have a strike on Crimea, which is significant. We have some frontline updates. Uh, we have uh, a bill, a couple bills that are being talked about uh, to be passed in the United States that we're going to also talk about today. Um, and some other stuff. Uh, and yes, can I get some turtle tank power in the chat? More successes via turtle tank that we're going to talk about today. So, oh, I hope everybody's doing good. I have had a busy morning. Uh, I get up at about 3.30 every morning. So today, this is kind of like the end of my day now. I usually do these live streams at the end of my work day. So it's been busy. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, let's go over to the map. We'll talk about the map a little bit, and then we will get into the more significant news. Uh, do, do, do. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get right into it. 3.30 a.m. If it has an a.m. in front of it, it's uh, morning time. Just so you guys know. The more you know. Uh, all right, Ukraine, you guys know Ukraine. Here's Kiev capital. You guys know, you guys know. Uh, all right, so we have a uh, further advance in Krasnohorivka. Uh, this is very significant now. Uh, remember, we saw the video of the turtle tank that basically drove up right here completely unmolested and just did what it needed to do. Uh, there are rumors that the Russians are now fighting in the refractory plant. Uh, which is not that, you know, difficult to suggest just because we, I mean, we already saw a tank right in this area and the front line is now, you know, 600 feet from uh, the industrial zone. If the Russians get a foothold in the industrial zone, the battle for Krasnohorivka is going to end very, 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 very quickly, uh, which is not good because if you guys remember, Krasnohorivka is on the uh 2014, 2015, 2016, uh, well, I mean, more like 2015, 2016 uh, fr freeze. So where the lines froze in 2014, 2015, 2016, uh, right along here, these are where all of the major fortifications are. So again, like Avdievka, if this breaks, I mean, with our, the Russians are already behind these defenses, but the Ukrainians can keep these defenses supplied still and, and manned. If the, you, if the Russians get behind these defenses, you are going to see another major breakthrough and you are going to see, again, something like, I imagine it will look something like this developing very, very quickly here. I mean, just look at how open the space is. There's not a lot of divides. There's not a lot of, um, I don't need to do this, but I'm kind of OCD right now. So I just want to finish this. I stopped smoking weed, guys, and it has been uh, difficult on my brain because I use it as medication for my ADHD. So something like this in the near future is what we could be looking at. Again, very significant, and it really plays into what I was talking about with the Russian offensive towards Pokrovsk. Um, I don't think this Russian offensive is going to be extremely aggressive and quick. I think it's going to be the continuation of this slow advance, but this slow advance is starting to become faster and faster and faster. And you're seeing larger and larger breakthroughs. It's becoming more risky and dangerous for the Ukrainians. So uh, on the backside, uh, you could be looking, I'm actually going to make this a different color. Red is it kind of blends in. So here, let me make it yellow. All right. So this is what we could be looking at in terms of a Russian advance here in the near future, along with, you know, this area potentially being captured and the Russians moving out from more Chitney. This whole line is just primed for collapse right now. There's not enough uh, Ukrainian manpower. Artillery shortages are becoming a major issue. And now we're seeing the FPV issue uh, on, you know, attacking convoys being solved with the turtle tank and electronic warfare. So uh, get ready. Uh, this area is going to see a lot of movement. I've been talking about Krasnohorivka for about a month now, talking about how this is going to be a significant area of, of collapse here. 
um, as the Ukrainians are focusing on trying to defend Evdievka with everything they have. Remember, the line here isn't very strong. Uh, and then this line has broken. So uh, with the fall of Krasnohorivka, you can expect a bunch of progress down here to the south as well. I think this southern section of the front is going to move um, very quickly. Remember, guys, if you have questions that you would like to ask, today's probably going to be a little bit of a lot longer live stream. If you have questions that you would like to ask, uh, you can always do that through Super Thanks. <laughs> okay, first off, guys, ADHD is not an excuse. Um, it is a evolutionarily uh, advantageous adaptation that no longer uh, is applicable in today's society. Uh, so that's, that's, that's what ADHD is. And that's what I use weed for. I am regularly, I smoke a little bit because it keeps me in my chair. It like calms me down, helps me focus. That's what I'm doing. So ADHD is not an excuse. It might be an excuse for some people, but, uh, I don't use it as an excuse. I just, it's a, it's a problem that I have to solve. All right. Enough about me. Uh, back to, uh, there's that ADHD coming in. Back to uh, the, the front, uh, the other areas we've seen significant advances um, by the Russians is this area uh, around Orchitny, just north of uh, this Krasnohorivka, different than the one we were just looking at, and just north of Berdichy. Uh, this advance is probably the most significant we've seen outside of uh, maybe this. This is very, very significant down here, and this gap right here is also significant. But this right here is, is, is devastating for the Ukrainian defense in this area. And I know this doesn't look like much. It's like one, two, you know, like one field maybe in total. Let's see, what is the area on it? Uh, less than one square mile, right? So it's not, it's not overly significant. But when we go over and take a look at the topographical map, and I'm actually going to pull up one that I have uh, drawn on. Uh, all right. Let's go. Oop. Sorry, I didn't even finish what I was saying. Um, if you guys want to support me just now that everybody's in here, you can do so. You can go to the links in my uh, in the description of this. Uh, I have restarted my Patreon. So my Patreon is back up and running now. If you guys would like to support me there, that's, the, well, that's another easy way you can uh, support my work. Um, also, following me on Telegram and Twitter are easy, free ways that you guys can support my work. Remember, you don't have to donate to support me. Just being here, watching this live stream is, is, is a lot of support, and I really appreciate everybody who's in here uh, supporting me right now and hopefully learning something about the conflict. So um, check out those links. Uh, follow me on all those places. Make sure you guys like and subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. That always helps. Uh, somebody asked, what's my favorite strain? Um, I, well, I'm an Indica guy. Um, and I like anything that's very, very purple. So, um, all right, let's get back to what we were talking about, the topographical map. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Here we go. All right, so this is the front line currently, uh, and you can see how important the advance that the Russians have made in this area is right here, right? So when, we, when we're looking, we can see that the Russians have advanced along, first off, the railroad, which is an important uh, geographical barrier that the, you, that the Russians are now following. Uh, they have penetrated into Orchitny, where they likely have a foothold now. Obviously, nothing is confirmed. This can get pushed out, whatever. But as of right now, the Russians have significantly or have captured a significant high, high ground right here. Um, and they will use this now to capture uh, Kermak, uh, Novo Kalinove. Uh, or Chitney, and then Nova Back Motivka here. So uh, this whole situation is becoming much, much, much more difficult for the Ukrainians. Um, I'm actually going to take us over to uh, the actual topographical map where I can show you guys what is happening on on this on uh, at a, on a bigger scale, on a larger scale. All right, here we go. Uh, so you guys can see that the Russians have advanced along this railroad. Once they capture Orchitny, they will have pretty much the highest territory in the area. I mean, it still continues out, but there's not a lot of uh, urban uh, settlement in this area. So it's hard to sit in here and actually utilize this high ground. Once the Russians capture Orchitny, 
this whole front is going to open wide open. You can see how this is a majority of the high ground in the region. Uh, the Russians are going to capture this, and then they will have uh, angles and view vantage on almost every single uh, on every single direction outside of Orchitney. So um, expect the Russian advance once this little uh, area right here is captured. They're about halfway right here, so they have you know about a mile more to go, uh, two miles maybe. Uh, before this entire high ground is captured, and then they will just be looking down on all of these settlements. Uh, there is some high ground here. Again, it's along this railway, but you can see how this is the dominant high ground in the region. Um, and and after Orchitney Falls, I, I think that's when the Russian offensive is going to start. Again, I don't think it's necessarily going to be this major uh, offensive, uh, but more of a pushing everywhere until something breaks and something is going to break. That's what we're looking at right now. All right. Uh, so, Scott, you can just buy manpower at the manpower store. I forgot. I forgot. Uh, yeah, we're, uh, so this somebody asks, uh, Landon asks, uh, Calibrated, I saw you just posted something from Fighter Bomber. Uh, what was that about? I will talk about that in just a second because that is some big news that just happened. Um, let's just finish with the front line. I think we're pretty much done. I just wanted to keep, I just wanted to really harp on this southern, uh, Pakrov's direction. Uh, the Russians, I mean, once they, once they catch or once they capture or Chitney, you know, they're going to be able to branch out. They're going to be able to look this way, uh, look down here and look down here. So you're going to be you're going to see a um, star begin to form something like that. And that that's going to be the blossom. And then the Russians are primarily going to continue following this like this, I imagine, all the way to Pokrovsk. I think that this is the Russian goal. This is this is what seems most likely to me now. And it is is backed up by the fact that we see all of this progress in this direction and a concerted effort by the Russians to advance here. Hello. All right. That's it for frontline updates though. Uh, we will move into uh, some news. All right. Uh, okay. We got some questions. Remember guys, if you have questions, uh, you can always, uh, donate through super chats. Uh, I, I put the super chat questions up for everybody to see, and I answer them no matter what they are usually, unless there's something horrible that I just don't want to show on stream. Um, what did you hear about Bundanov being killed? Okay. So there was a Russian strike in the Kharkov region, I believe at a staging point. Um, I don't believe they're talking about the Chernigov strike. I believe they're talking about the Kharkov strike, which was actually in the forest. There were some rumors that Bundanov was there. Guys, um, when it comes to these sort of rumors, I just dismiss them. Um, we've heard this multiple times. You know, Shoigu got killed. Uh, Grosmo got killed. Putin got killed. Zelensky's dead. Uh, Zeluzhny's dead. Bundanov is dead. We've heard this time and time again. You'll know when somebody dies. It's going to be a very, 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 very big deal. Okay. Um, I don't believe he was killed. I believe that he's probably being protected, unlike anybody else in the country right now. Everybody in the SBU is probably being overly protected because of the situation that they're in. Uh, they're likely going to be deemed a terrorist organization very soon. So, you know, that that, you know, they're targets. So I doubt that they're doing a lot of frontline visits. I doubt they're doing anything in that direction. I would not put any weight in the fact that he was killed. What is more impressive about that event is the fact that Russian ISR is so strong now and Ukrainian air defense is so degraded that Russian drones can just be anywhere uh, over Ukraine, basically uh, conducting strikes. And we just saw that with what uh, that last thing I talked about with fighter bomber. Uh, we, we saw that with the recent strike on Dnepropetrovsk, which the footage has yet to be released, but he's promised it. And we've seen a screenshot, so it's coming. They're just teasing. Uh, let's see. Brother, I like Putin, but I hate how he's doing everything. Uh, but you, Garland Nick, Nick, uh, Nixon, uh, the Atlas guys are very comfortable with him. Why? Uh, because, uh, so I, I think the reason that you probably don't like what Putin is doing is because of 
the approach that he's taking. Uh, but the way I see it is Putin is playing a long-term strategic game. Uh, the U.S. is not playing this game. The U.S. is playing a short-term game to maintain their hegemony. They're not thinking about long-term moves, long-term goals, what things are going to turn into. Whereas Putin, Lavrov, uh, you know, the, the, the Russian cabinet, basically, you know, the Kremlin, if you will, uh, they seem very uh, down-to-earth. They seem like they understand their strengths, their weaknesses, what they need to play on. Uh, Lavrov is killing it uh, in foreign policy. Uh, Putin is currently beating the United States, which is a crazy thing to say. He got sanctioned by the United States. He's at war through a proxy with the United States, and he's winning right now. And everybody is claiming that. Politico is even saying it. So, I mean, this is that he, he is doing the right things for Russia. Um, and while you might not agree with every single thing he does, and I definitely don't, I do think that he's been a little weak when the U S responds to strength. Uh, but you know, these are cultural differences and these are things that you just have to learn to kind of deal with. Um, but I can definitely see why you might not think he's doing the right thing. I mean, it's, it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable take. I just think he's doing the right thing for the future of Russia and not necessarily perhaps the right thing to say, win the war in Ukraine or something like that immediately. They're, they're two different things. But thank you for those questions, guys. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, let's get back to the topic at hand. I'm going to show you guys some bookmark stuff I have saved. Um, so there was a strike on Crimea. Um, actually I'll just talk about it because I don't want to show the footage because if I show the footage, I will get, uh, banned or demonetized. So, um, and it's not that important. Uh, there was a Ukrainian attack strike on, uh, a Crimean airfield. Uh, this is a significant event. Uh, one, because there, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about Ukraine receiving, uh, attack and using them on Russian territory. And while Ukraine doesn't consider Crimea to be Russian territory, Russia considers Crimea to be Russian territory. And I will lay it out for you guys. Crimea to the Russians is different than the new four oblasts. I know they make it sound like these oblasts are Russian territory and they, they are Russian territory, but the allowance for Ukrainian uh, mischief in the four regions <clears throat> is much higher than the allowance for this mischief on Russian territory proper. And I think you guys can clearly see that. I mean, when you strike Luhansk, there's much less reaction than when Belgorod is struck. Uh, when, uh, you know, oil or some infrastructure facility in the four regions, the four oblasts is struck, it's much different than oil refineries in Russia, right? So there, there is definitely a difference in how they approach uh, escalation and stuff in these regions. This attack was Ukrainian ATACMs on Crimea. Um, so again, uh, I put out a tweet saying, I, you know, I, I talked about the strike and then a lot of people said I was coping because I specifically said, unfortunately for Ukraine, this means that there's going to be less Ukraine. And people were saying that I was coping because of that. But it's clearly stated that if Ukraine is using Western long range weapon systems on Russian territory, there will be a buffer zone implemented to keep those weapons away from Russian territory. It's, it's as simple as that. And that's exactly what's going to happen. You will see a sanitation zone, whatever you want to call it, implemented wherever the Russians decide to stop past that, you will see this implemented. And that means less Ukraine. So it's just a factual statement. I don't know how that's coping. But um, the strike was carried out with probably about 20 ATACMs like the last strike we saw. Um, it looks like they destroyed an S-300 system. A lot of the pro-Ukrainian accounts have been claiming S-400. However, when you look at the tells, it's very clear uh, that they're S-300. I, I will show you guys that. Um, it is a loss, but uh, you know the Russians can replace air defense. Uh, according to Russian sources, this air defense system, uh, this battery was actually being uh, just staged in the region. So there were no casualties or at the airfield. So there were no casualties. Whether you choose to believe that, it's up to you. I'm not. I'm not going to say you know the whole crew survived thing. I don't. I don't. It doesn't make a difference to me. Um, that's just what their claim is. So that's that's the Ukraine. That's the Russian claim. Uh, the Ukrainian claim was 
absolutely ridiculous. And I can actually show you uh, what the Ukrainian claim was uh, by going to one of our favorite accounts, Ukraine Battle Maps, uh, who has been only nonstop talking about this uh, for like the last two days or last day, uh, last 24 hours in total, because there's nothing good going for Ukraine. And then this is the only thing they can talk about. So I will uh, take you guys over to that so you can see what I'm talking about. We've got another question. So it's tactic, not fear, right? I don't know what you mean by that. Are you talking about Putin? Because I do believe Putin is leading tactically and not through fear. Again, that's a lot of that is just Western propaganda. You, if, you, if, you, if you listen to the guy talk, he's literally a Russian liberal. He's the least hardline person in all of Russia and probably the only person who actually will make a deal with Ukraine still, the only person who would make a deal with the West still, even after all that he's been through, even though it would be a horrible decision, I still think he probably thinks he can make it work. All right. I'll take you guys over to that um, post so you guys can see the schizo posting about this. So there was quite a big fire again, a, uh, and firms is not the best. So when you see like a fire over here and a fire over here and a fire over here, this is probably just w one large fire. Uh, it's not always the most accurate in terms of where they put these things, but let's just say that there were one, two, three, four, five, six major fires on the airfield. Um, th this, this is the claim, right? Uh, and <laughs> you know, according to Ukraine battle maps, uh, there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 ports for parking helicopters and some aircraft ports. But really what was probably hit was the air defense that was stationed right here. Um, if we go up, we can see how uh, he talks about it. Uh, up to 10 MI-28 helicopters destroyed, two KA-52 helicopters, an S-400 air defense system, ammunition and missiles, uh, 100 to $300 million in Ukraine's most successful strike ever. Uh, we got this picture, which we could not confirm, uh, no geolocation. It looks like one, two, three, four tells destroyed and potentially a radar destroyed back here, damaged. I don't know, it's hard to tell with these. They, they obviously have some burn damage, um, uh, you know, external burn damage, not internal burn damage. So we don't know the, the condition of these two back here. They could be further back too. Uh, but if you look at the cage on the outside of this one, and I will show you guys in just a second, this is an S300 cage. Uh, S400s have one bar, S300s have two. So I'll take you back over here. Uh, and I, oh wait, that's on my bookmarks. Um, but you can see he, all he's done for the past couple hours is talk about uh, this, this, is, this system that's got destroyed. He's literally posted this picture like four times. This is the best thing they got going on. So <laughs> it's just goofy. All right. I'm going to take us over to our bookmarks. Um, here uh, you can see uh, a, a very good uh, um, source for this stuff is talking about how uh, Andrew uh, claimed uh, four S 400 system or five S 400 systems destroyed. Uh, when in reality, it's, it's likely an S 300 battery. Um, all right. So that was the Crimean attack. It was, it was a, it's a significant attack. Uh, but again, it probably incorporated almost all of the ATACMs that were recently delivered. Uh, Ukraine is going to keep doing this. They're going to get some ATACMs every three months or so, and they're going to launch them all in one salvo and do a little bit of damage. That's what's going to happen. And you guys should probably just get used to that. Uh, again, saturation attacks work. Uh, we, we saw it with Iran and Israel. Uh, Israel has some of the best air defense in the world, some of the densest air defense in the world when it, when it is accompanied by uh, multiple air forces in the region, uh, multiple different countries assisting Israel, and, and Iran still penetrated their air defense system and hit a protected base that they knew was going to be targeted. Um, that's just how air defense works. Air defense is about reducing the overall damage. If you can have 50% of the damage done to you instead of 100% of the damage, that's the benefit of air defense, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a numbers game. Uh, when do you think the Russians will reach Pokrovsk? I have no idea, uh, but I think by uh, the end of the summer season, so September, October, I think the Russians could be 
in a bunch of different areas that you would not imagine them being in right now. So whether that means Pokrovsk or Kharkov or, uh, you know, Seversk or Slavyansk or something like that, I think I think you guys will be very, very surprised in <clears throat> three or four months when you look back on the the uh, front line. I mean, if 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 four months ago, if four months ago I had told you uh, that the Russians would be. You know, if the Russians if I would have said. Before Avdiivka fell, if I would have said in four months, the Russians will be pushing for Orchitny and the front line will be leveled out around Berdichi, Semenkivka, Omansk, Novelske. I mean, that's that's crazy for this. I mean, this. This is like more advance than we saw from the Russians, you know, the entire war. Oh, oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, hold on, I'll show you guys. So it was like something like this. Right. And down here. I mean, look at how much advanced that is. Oh, wait, it was it was up here. Like, look how much advanced that is right there. The Russians have done that in four months. And I know it might not seem like super significant, um, but in terms of what they did in 2023, that's major. And that's just one section of the front. They've also entered Krasnoharivka. They've captured this area. You know, they're they're moving in all directions. They moved out of Bakhmut um, towards Chasov Yar. They've entered Chasov Yar. Uh, you know, that th this is a, the, the advances are coming much quicker. And they're, and they're just going to continue to happen faster and faster as Ukrainian manpower and equipment becomes less and less uh, available. So when do I think they'll reach Pokrovsk? I'm, I never I don't want to give dates for this stuff because you never know what happens. Uh, there could be a Russian collapse tomorrow and, you know, the Russians may leave Ukraine. Uh, you don't know. Um, but I would say by the end of summer, you will you will likely see the Russians in areas you would not have expected to see them uh, right now. Uh, yeah. And then this is something you guys should also think about too. One successful strike on Crimea versus 10 successful strikes on, uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's more like a hundred glide bombs landing on Ukraine all day, missiles landing on Ukraine, drones landing on Ukraine. Yeah. You see one, uh, Ukrainian strike and they put it everywhere. Uh, but I mean, what we're about to talk about, which is fighter bomber is, uh, exactly why, you should be very cautious about, you know, celebrating these kind of things just because of what can happen, uh, you know, what can, what can happen in, in the next 24 hours. So I'm going to start talking about the fighter bomber topic that was asked about earlier uh, for those of you who, who are listening. Uh, so fighter bomber uh, made a post today. You guys can read it here. Um, <clears throat> I just can't resist. Well, I can't. Well, I just can't. Uh, and remember, fighter bomber is Russian, and this is a translation. So uh, thanks to the real Ukrainians, one stubborn major and an unknown captain from the fire destruction group. Today, we finally fucked <laughs> this up, this fucking aviator. Two MiG, two MiG 29s and an S 300 battery entered the hangar. And yes, I have the most epic, epic video proofs. But until uh, the first persons get acquainted with the video, uh, show it to me. We'll wait a couple of hours. Thank you for your work. It was all, it wasn't all in vain. Um, so basically what he's saying here is two MiGs and an S-300 battery were destroyed, likely at the Dnipropetrovsk airport. As you can see here, there was a significant fire uh, that was burning, uh, a couple significant fires. So tit for tat, basically, uh, if Russia just lost an S-300 at their base in Crimea. Ukraine just lost an S-300 and likely two MiGs at a base in uh, Dnipropetrovsk. Uh, here you can see the base. Uh, I don't know where the, the target was, and I know that's really small for you guys. I didn't know it was going to be that small. but So that is pretty significant. And uh, here is a teaser. Uh, I believe that this is the S-300. I don't know for sure, though. I don't know how many vehicles. I don't know where it's parked. Uh, and this looks like the MiG-29. You can see how they're using these bases like very temporarily. There'll be one or two planes positioned. They're ready to take off at any given time. But this is Dnipropetrovsk, and this is being watched by a drone. So 
Uh, what's with Mike? Oh, did something happen? I don't know. All right. Uh, I'm actually going to take us over to the map just so I can show you guys where this occurred at. So we zoom out. Nepo Petrosk is right here. Uh, where is that airfield at? Uh, it's right here. So here's the airfield that they're talking about in question. I believe right here is where potentially the MiG was struck or over here. Maybe over here. Oh, yeah, right here. Right here. So this area, you can see it looks very different than how it looks on the map. These planes are still here, obviously abandoned. There was a MiG right here. And I imagine these hangars uh, now likely destroyed could potentially be holding uh, the S-300 uh, system. There was also something right here. Don't know which is which. Uh, time will tell. But the important part of this is that the Russians have drone coverage. Uh, wrong thing. The Russians have drone coverage 62 miles behind Ukrainian lines. Uh, let's just say the drone is flying, you know, 10 miles away. So 50 miles. That is unbelievably horrible for the Ukrainians. That means every single logistic uh, delivery through, Dniep for, through Dniepro or Zaporozhia uh, is being watched by uh, Russian reconnaissance drones. That's how bad the air defense is now in Ukraine. Really, it's not so much probably the air defense because they still have air defense systems. What's really lacking is the radar coverage. There's huge gaps in their radar. And the Russians are now flying drones in this, this area of Ukraine, which does not um, bode very well for the frontline uh, logistics situation. So pretty, pretty significant stuff here, guys. Um, <clears throat> okay, mic works. Good. All right. All right. All right. Yes. Iskander keeps bonking high value stuff. And we're seeing three or four Iskanders used on targets previously that we would have seen one Iskander used, which is actually a great segue into our final topic. Uh, there was a propaganda uh, campaign ran against the um, Russian military after they struck a hotel. Uh, here you can see the hotel in Chernigov. Um, the claim was by the Ukrainians because there was a video from the hospital. So here's the hotel. Here's the hospital. This hotel was struck with three ballistic missiles, uh, according to uh, the video that you can go see on my profile or in uh, Telegram. Uh, on my Telegram, you can see the video of the of the third missile striking this building. Uh, the the woman the, or the group of people is viewing it here. There's a bus uh, arriving, public transportation, I believe, uh, picking people up and dropping people off right here. They're videotaping it, and you can see the missile basically fly in and land on this building. Here's the hospital. Uh, the hospital, there was somebody videotaping in the hospital after the first explosion. Uh, the second or third explosion blew out more windows and caused uh, the building to shake, uh, which you know prompted the Ukrainians to say that the hospital was hit. It was not targeted at all. This is a civilian hospital. Um, there is no, I mean, at least as far as we can tell, there were no military in this uh, hospital and it was not targeted. The hotel was targeted and the hotel was specifically targeted because it was reported that the Northern Command, uh, they call it OKW North or OK North, which is Ober Command, which if you guys don't know is what the Germans call it. Um, it's so funny. Um, the Ober Command, uh, went ahead and, um, did, uh, let's see. Oberkommand was meeting in this hotel at the time of the strike. Uh, there were dozens of military casualties, but the claim was that it was all civilian. So we go through, we can see, uh, this man is wearing, uh, knee pads, long pants, boots. Uh, we have one, two, uh, three individuals blurred, uh, does not bode well for the overall situation. Definitely military, uh, was at this scene of the strike. Um, and here we have a Ukrainian source talking about, uh, the arrival at the hotel where the military was staying, uh, many dead and more wounded. Uh, yeah. So this is, this was a significant strike. 
uh, caused some significant damage. And they are saying that some Ukrainian leadership from the Northern District uh, was present at the time of the strike. Uh, you know, this, this, is, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about decapitation strikes. This is the start of a new campaign against Russian mili or Ukrainian military leadership. This is something you would not have seen a year ago. All right. All right, guys, if you have questions, go ahead and get them in. Go ahead and get them in. Um, I'm going to talk about the bill now. So we saw a... Uh, we saw the leader, uh, Mike Johnson, of the uh, Republican, uh, the Republican leader of the House. I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I, I just got back from the gym, so I'm like kind of absent-minded with, with, with which direction I want to take things when I'm talking. Um, we saw him bring forward three new bills for the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Congress uh, or Senate and House to vote on. Uh, these bills include aid for Taiwan, Israel, and Ukraine. They are separate uh, because they are having a very difficult time passing all three of these bills together. Democrats don't want to vote on Israeli funding, and the Republicans don't want to vote on uh, Ukraine funding. So there, you know, th there's a lot going on behind the scenes. U.S. politics is very complicated. Apparently, it doesn't seem like a lot of Europeans understand how U.S. politics work. A lot of people are calling uh, Johnson a traitor to the United States. I mean, whatever you believe about the Ukraine project, uh, he, he wants to fund it. He makes a boatload of money if it passes. I don't think people understand how U.S. politics work. It's all about negating damage to your party, to your reputation, while maximizing the greed and money you can get out of any given situation. It has nothing to do what's beneficial for America, has nothing... Uh, to do with what's beneficial for the American people. It's all about keeping the economy booming, uh, which I guess technically is beneficial, and that's how they sell it to themselves. Uh, but they don't care at what cost it comes at. Maintaining hegemony and ma maintaining uh, you know, the U.S. sphere of influence around the world is most important. Um, so this bill, it, it, this isn't a Mike Johnson thing where he's being some Russian agent. No, this is a U.S. political thing where it, if it wasn't Ukraine, it would just be a different thing that they would be arguing over. It just ha it just so happens that Ukraine is taking up the most money from uh, you know U.S. foreign policy right now, uh, and the most energy and time. And it's something very important to the Biden administration. That's why it's being it's so politic. It's such a political hot topic. It's not because there's you know Russian money involved, and you know they don't want to go against the Russians. This, that, and the other. No, they don't give a shit about the Russians. They hate the Russians. Every, all of them do. They, they, all they want to do is make money. A weak Russia means that they make more money. So this is not a Republican being against Ukraine thing. This is a United States political battle that you are seeing. And welcome to the United States. Uh, this is how things run here. It's... Uh, it's like it's like the TV show House of Cards, guys. It's not It's not about reality. It's not about rationality. It's about politics. It's all it is. Um, I believe that the Ukraine aid is going to pass. Um, it has been a long time coming. Uh, I thought it was going to pass in January, um, but it's been delayed this long. I think the damage has already been done to Ukraine. I think Ukraine can see that the damage, the reputation damage has been done. The uh, relationship between the U.S. and uh, Ukraine has become horrible and toxic. Um, it's only going to progressively get worse. Uh, even if aid fund funding passes, guys, I would like to reiterate that Ukraine has two major, major issues. Well, three, I guess, but two of them are kind of similar. Um, ammunition, which goes for artillery shells and, you know, air defense interceptors and stuff like that. That's a major problem. And those are not going to be solved just because more money is introduced. You can print all the money you want. It's not going to... Uh, in increase the number of shells you can produce right now, right? This this funding, most of the funding, by the way, for Ukraine, for Israel, and for Taiwan 
is just a stimulus package for the U.S. military industrial complex. This is not going to really benefit Ukraine all that much. It's not enough funding. It's much less than the 61 million that was originally intended for, or 61 billion, sorry, that was originally intended for Ukraine. It looks like it's going to be around 40 billion with more than 20 billion of that going right back into the U.S. military industrial complex, which the results of that won't be seen until 2026, 2027. Right. So Ukraine's artillery shell shortage is not going to be solved. It, they would be sending the shells if they had them already. That's that, that, that is just an excuse. There, it is not a funding thing. There are not enough Patriot interceptors. Uh, Ukraine is asking for something like seven Patriot batteries. There are not enough interceptors for those batteries. They can send as many launchers as they want. The bottleneck is not these systems. The bottleneck is the interceptors. Right. That's that's where the bottleneck is. Same with artillery shells and same with manpower. You know what you cannot buy with money? 18 year old men who can who you can legally send and die in trenches. You can hire, uh, you know, uh, mercenaries and stuff, but there's not that many left. They I, there's not this endless pool of global mercenaries who want to go fight for the West. They, they don't exist. Right. There are mercenaries, but they don't want to go and die in Ukraine. Ukraine is not a good mercenary place to be. Ukraine is a bad place to be if you're a mercenary. The money's not particularly good and the work is grueling and it doesn't pay off for you at all. Um, if, you know, if you're a good contractor, you can go work in some shithole African uh, country for, you know, three to six months and make two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it, Ukraine is not where mercenaries want to go. This is not, the West is going to have a hard time getting anybody to go fight for Ukraine. They've already said multiple times they're not sending their own troops. So the bottlenecks are not going to be solved by this funding. Um, it's actually probably just going to make things worse. You're going to have the illusion of support, uh, which will enable the fighting to continue and the negotiations at, or the surrender to be further stalled, which means less Ukraine, less Ukrainian culture, less Ukrainian uh, population. It's just not good for Ukraine. So I don't know where they're expecting to go with this. I don't know how they're expecting this to work out, but uh, it won't basically is what is what's going to happen here. All right, guys, if you have anything that you want me to talk about, go ahead and throw it in right now. If you don't, uh, I might wrap it up here in a little bit. I don't mind talking to you guys for a little bit, though. It's been a, it's kind of a slow time. Hopefully this uh, Nepro strike comes out today and we get to uh, see it. Also, I ignored my girlfriend's call because I'm on stream, guys, so that's how much I care about you. Homies before the hose, you know what I mean? Yeah, but this is so you can. This guy says you can hire women for uh, reproduction or force women to have children. Yeah, but that's still a 20 year plan. That's not going to give you manpower tomorrow like the Ukrainians need. Oh, the id idiocracy in Georgia. So. The Georgian government just passed a very, very, very beneficial bill for Georgia, which is a anti-foreign agent act that basically hamstrings the um, operations of NGOs, uh, which is, if anybody doesn't know what an NGO is, um, an NGO is a foreign funded uh group in any given country that tries to affect uh, policy uh, and, you know, create influence in a given country. Um, so this bill is super beneficial for Georgia. It allows, I mean, it prevents Russian interference. It prevents Western interference. It keeps Georgia Georgian, right? But, uh, you know, with uh, the whole I mean, I, I don't know what you would even call them. It's the 20 somethings that the 20 something liberals that for some reason perfectly align with US foreign policy and never question it. It's the Georgians that are pro Ukrainian, pro Taiwan, pro Israel. It's the weirdest shit I've ever seen. I don't know how these human beings exist, but 
they're very upset now because U.S. influence is going to be weakened in Georgia. And they're trying to do a little Maidan thing. Um, I don't think it's really going to come out too much because I don't think the U.S. has the same sort of influence. And I don't think Georgia is as ripe uh, for uh, Western influence as Ukraine was in 2014. Um, I just, you know, this is a, it's, it's a very goofy thing. It's, it's like a, it's like they're anti-Georgian. They're, they're pro-American and anti-Georgian. And it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's just like the people who did, uh, made on, they didn't understand what they were actually doing. They didn't understand that they were setting themselves up, uh, to go to war with Russia in 10 years. Right. They didn't know that that was what was going to happen. So here they are. Uh, yeah, they're literally working for Western NGOs. So the people that I'm talking about, this is exactly true. This, this is what I meant. I don't understand how these people exist, but you do understand because they're being paid. They work for these NGOs. This is like, uh, the American endowment for democracy. Uh, you know, Brian Beletic from the new Atlas talks about it, them regularly because they're everywhere in the in Southeast Asia. And they're just these NGOs that come in and try to influence, uh, a country's politics, try to bring them over to the West, try to pull them away from China, Iran, Russia, whoever the U.S. Uh, observes or uh, deems their adversary. Uh, so this is a very good bill for Georgia. Um, but obviously, uh, th those that be in power in the West do not like it. Uh, will robotic soldiers... Uh, and drone soldiers replace flesh soldiers. Yeah, I mean, we're already seeing it. I don't, any time you can put a drone in place of a man uh, successfully, it's going to pay off. Will man, you know, men on the front line ever be replaced? Probably not. Uh, right now, at least manpower is much, much, much cheaper than uh, any like Dyson robotics thing. I mean, they don't mass produce them. So in terms of like a Terminator army, uh, you probably won't see that for 30 or 40 years, but uh, yeah, I mean, drones are definitely going to be replacing humans. That goes for every aspect of life, not just on the battlefield, though. Uh, if you have a low-skill job, prepare your, yourselves for being replaced. If you guys are in a low-skill uh, career right now, I, and I don't mean low-skill as in it doesn't require skill or, you know, it's just, it's just one of those jobs that can be replaced by robotics. Eventually start trying to find something that can't be replaced by robotics that plenty of jobs and plenty of career choices are out there that do not involve, uh, you know, a robotic machine, uh, confiscating your job. Uh, I mean, they've already been born. They've actually been fighting terminators since the eighties. You just, you guys don't know about it because the government hides it up. <laughs> so stupid. Uh, can you explain what happened with the 32 D20 howitzers in Sumi? How many warehouses like that are like that in Ukraine? So uh, what happened with those is those howitzers are likely um, not usable in their current form. They are uh, just sitting and... Uh, according to satellite pictures, the there were 46 of them, and at the time of the strike, there were 32. Um, so, and all 32 of these howitzers were sitting in one place, and a lot of people were saying, "This has been sitting here the whole war. Why hasn't Russia targeted it?" Uh, because there's no point to target 46 abandoned or stored howitzers uh, that aren't doing anything, right? Uh, especially if you don't know the condition of them. Uh, the Russians were in this area. I imagine they went, they, they saw these, they didn't take them with them. They were like, this is just not uh, worth our time. However, when you're Ukraine and you are starving for barrels, when you're starving for parts, when you're able to refurbish really, really trashed howitzers and bring them back up to some sort of use, if you could get four operational howitzers out of those 32 sitting there, why not? Right. And as soon as they began to be taken out for refurbishment or uh, cannibalizing them or whatever they were being used for, uh, Russia struck them. So uh, again, this is, I mean, this is not as significant, but this is like uh, a parts warehouse basically being struck. That's, that's how I would best explain what happened in the Sumi region. 
Oh, uh, well, we see Zelensky's autumn infantry offensive any chance. No, I don't think the Ukrainians will ever be on the offensive ever again. Uh, hey, Scott, what's your favorite cheat meal? Are you big on carbs? Yes, I, I, so my body type, I, guys, I burn so many calories and I know not everybody's interested in this, but I also do like training and bodybuilding and stuff, or I did for a long time, get back into it. Now I put on about 10 pounds. I don't know if you guys can see it, but my face is changing. Um, I just had more time to go to the gym and start focusing on eating. Uh, I eat a majority. I mean, I eat my protein first, but then I eat carbs and fats like no other. I am not a good example uh, because my body type is unlike most other human beings, unless you're a six foot four skinny human being who basically like can eat whatever they want. If that's your body type, then listen to what I'm saying. Eat every single thing you can. I don't have, I, I, I cheat constantly. Um, I have to, or I just evaporate. I get my macros in. So I get my protein in, I make sure I get my carbs in. Uh, but, uh, I, I eat probably four, 4,500 calories a day. Usually if I can, it's a lot of food. Um, but I have like two protein shakes two like mass gaining protein shakes a day. Um, I do a bunch of different stuff like that. So I'm lifting right now, uh, each peanut butter or wait, each peanut butter out of the jar. Oh, you eat peanut butter out of the jar for protein. Yeah, I do the same thing. I have two huge things of protein or uh, peanut butter downstairs. Um, I like to do waffles. Uh, so I'll do waffles and I'll do pro or peanut butter on each waffle and then, uh, you know, just syrup and stuff. And then that's how I get, um, that's how I get a lot of my, uh, diet in. Um, yeah, low carb is good. It's a low carb is usually much more beneficial for people like a more of a carnivore sort of diet where you're doing uh, a lot more protein and higher fats. Um, I can't do that. Um, I, I, I've had coaches try to do that for me when I'm doing a competition. Um, even before I go into my shows, uh, you know, most people are eating like 12 to 2100 calories. I'm still eating like 300 or 3000 calories going into my shows, just because I will literally evaporate into nothing. Uh, grass-fed beef and free-range eggs are the goat for health and weightlifting. I eat uh, ranged eggs. I don't eat free-range. I, I want to feel the suffering. I want to taste that that torture, that little, you know, that lifelong depression that those chickens have. I want it to be projected into that egg, and I want to eat that egg and go, yeah, this this chicken was not having a good time. Um, all right, guys, I think that's where I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you everybody for watching. Remember, if you guys want to support me, you can go do so by, uh, subscribing to my Patreon. That's the easiest way. Uh, you remember, you can always ask uh, questions anytime I'm on my live stream. Super thanks, uh, super stickers, anything like that. That's a good way to support me. I really appreciate all of my uh, really, really hardcore fans who, uh, ask questions and donate. You guys make my life so much easier. I really appreciate it. Uh, this guy just says looking huge, which I appreciate guys. I appreciate it. I'm trying, I'm getting back into it. I was skinny. I'll post pictures here, uh, probably in the next couple months. Uh, I got sick for a while and my shoulder was bugging me. So I got down to like two, two, two eighteen. Now I'm back up to like two thirty five. I'm feeling good. So, uh, everybody take care. If you, if you want to support me, Patreon, Telegram, and Twitter, all in my, all in the description, go follow me there. If you guys wouldn't mind liking this, it helps me so much. Please subscribe. Uh, and I will see you next time, guys. Take care, be safe, enjoy your weekend. If I don't see you until after it, goodbye.